Henry VIII was one of the greatest kings of English history. And he's remembered for a couple of things. Of course, he's remembered for having six wives, two of whom he had executed for adultery, and two he divorced. One died in childbirth, and the last survived him. The other thing Henry VIII is best known for is for his attacks on the Catholic Church. During the proceedings of his first divorce from Catherine of Aragon, Henry had been a loyal son of the church, and he had attempted to do things through the channels of the church and seeking an annulment. Now, historians will always point out that Henry took the absolute hardest path possible by seeking to claim that the Pope had no right to suspend the rules that originally had barred Henry VIII from marrying Catherine of Aragon because she had previously been married to his brother, and therefore she was his sister-in-law. And during the trial proceedings, Henry, perhaps full of himself, perhaps led astray by his counselors, had come to the conclusion that the papacy would see the justice of his case and would absolve the marriage, and therefore he could remarry with the full conviction of the church. However, the papacy didn't see it this way. And so, in the end, Henry was not granted a divorce or an annulment from the papacy. And in the early 1530s, Henry decided that he was going to go his own way. Documents from Henry's church began to refer to him as the supreme head of church and state, as somehow both ruler of the church in some sort of governance sense, as well as the rightful king and heir of the English peoples. And so by 1534, Henry was declared head of church and state. He and his right-hand man Cromwell, though, then set about to dissolve the monasteries. Of course, the monasteries, the monks of England, were a rich heritage. They had been the full supporters of the English church, and quite a number of the abuses of the church just prior to the Reformation that you see in Germany or in the Netherlands or even in France really don't exist in England. The English church under Henry was a well-oiled machine. It was really strong. But in his righteous indignation against the papacy, it was the monks who bore the brunt of his anger. And so Henry had a majority of the monasteries of England dissolved, and their money was taken and either redistributed for other purposes, or they were simply absorbed into the royal coffers. And one of the major abbeys that was eventually absolved and removed and the monks sent off on a pension, was Hyde Abbey. Now, Hyde Abbey was a landmark for Tudor England, because in Hyde Abbey was buried Alfred the Great. Alfred had been the first codifier and the first king to bring together anything that began to look like the shape of modern England. He had refounded and vindicated and brought back into the English orbit the city of London, for example. And his legal and educational reforms were the things that put England on the path to dominance in the Middle Ages. In fact, it was the 16th century humanists in England who gave Alfred the title The Great. And to this day, Alfred is the only English king or queen to ever have the title Great, Alfred the Great. But with Henry VIII's dissolution of Hyde Abbey, what was lost was the burial place of Alfred and the loss of his bones. The records seem to indicate that he was buried somehow beneath the altar, or at least in that vicinity, which was very common for someone who was hailed and beloved of the English peoples, particularly monarchs. But Hyde Abbey was destroyed, at least from its internal structure, and the monks sent off. And despite some indication from time to time that we have rediscovered the bones of Alfred the Great, in fact, scientific evidence has always pointed out that these are not the bones of Alfred. And so it is actually quite a bit of a strange thing from Tudor England that the same century that gave Alfred the title the Great also destroyed his graveyard and lost his bones forever. In this lecture, we're going to look at Alfred the Great and his role as King of Anglo-Saxony. We're going to look at how he defended England against the Danes, against the Vikings who were from the Danish regions. And we're going to look at some of his reforms and his support for both the church, education, and for the foundation of what would become the modern legal English system. Now, we begin by looking at the geography of Anglo-Saxon England. And Anglo-Saxon England at this time has four main areas, though there are some smaller areas as well. The main one, in terms of cultural legacy, in terms of learning, in terms of power, is Northumbria, 
In Northumbria was the center of learning for Anglo-Saxon England. It is in Northumbria where the Lindisfarne Monastery is, as well as a number of others. And it's where the Venerable Bede and other significant scholars in the early medieval period had come from. And the name Northumbria comes from the fact that it is north of the Humber River, North Humber, Northumbria. But there were several others as well. There was Mercia, one of the main powerhouses there in Anglo-Saxony. And then there was Wessex, and then there is Sussex. There's also an area called East Anglia, and a number of others. Now, just as a side note, those of you who are Tolkien fans should know that this period of time is Tolkien's main area of interest in his research. In fact, Tolkien, in his day, was one of the main leading scholars on the area of Mercia in Anglo-Saxon England. And the king of Wessex at this time was a man by the name of Aethelwulf. And Aethelwulf had a number of sons, the youngest of whom is Alfred who will eventually become king of Wessex. Now, Alfred is a bit of a mix of historical figure and legend, which seems to be the case for most countries and most nations, both in the past and even today. The founding fathers of any nation always take on a sort of cult status and lots of stories about their virtue, or of how they were intellectually curious at even a young age before they became famous at a later date is always sort of the norm for founding myths. And Alfred is not free of these either. There are a number of stories about his youth that are certainly mythical. One involves Alfred becoming a poet at even a young age and his poetry being recognized by his tutors. Another involves Alfred traveling to Rome at a young age and there somehow, out of nowhere, the papacy simply coronates Alfred as the King of Wessex. Now, in both of these myths, there's a little bit of a kernel of truth as to what Alfred will become when he is actually king. On the one hand, Alfred is one of the most learned kings in the entire Middle Ages. In fact, he's one of the most learned kings in England ever. More on that in a minute. The other myth is that the papacy somehow recognized in the young Alfred a man that needed to be king of Wessex, even though he was the youngest brother of his clan. And that really seems to signify that in a later date, Alfred will be a powerful supporter of the church in his regions. But separating out the myth and looking at the man himself, Alfred was really not destined for the throne. He was the youngest brother of a really powerful family. But in 865, the Danish Vikings, coming over from the Scandinavian regions, landed on the English shores, intent to settle permanently. And the Danish invasion of Anglo-Saxon England is really apocalyptic for some of the nations. The Danes take the city of York right off the bat. In fact, even today, you can go to the city of York and see the Viking remains. They had so conquered York and taken it under their wing and created a permanent settlement there that the excavations in recent years have actually uncovered an almost entire village of the Vikings. The Danes then kill the king of Northumbria, And they move on to take not only East Anglia, but also Mercia as well. And it is during the battles with the Danes that Alfred rises to the throne. Because during this time, for various reasons, Alfred's brothers all die before the age of 30. And so in 871, despite the odds stacked against him ever reaching the throne, Alfred is coronated King of Wessex. And Alfred initially tries to make peace with the Danes. He doesn't seek to take back any of these lands. They're not his lands to begin with. He is the king of Wessex. And a treaty is proposed and it is signed, but it doesn't last very long. And within four years, the Danes again begin attacking, this time under the leadership of a man by the name of Ivar the Boneless, one of the great names in Viking history. And the nickname Boneless uh, is a bit hard to understand. It could mean one of two things. Either he had some sort of crazy flexibility some kind of lithe way that he would swing the axe while on the battlefield that made him seem almost boneless, that he was very nimble. The other option is that he had lost perhaps a leg and that he was therefore boneless from that part of the leg down. In either case, Ivar the Boneless attacks Alfred in the area of Wessex and seeks to take it over. Well, Ivar was certainly a powerful match for Alfred and the Wessex armies. And It seemed as if Alfred was going to lose as well, that the Danes would eventually take all of Anglo-Saxony, and that what would become England would have ceased to exist at that point. At one fateful moment, 
the Vikings made a surprise attack on Alfred and his armies, and nearly the entirety of Alfred's armies are destroyed, and, at least according to the legend, Alfred rode off into the marshes or into the swamp areas around the area of Somerset in the southwest part of England, and he was in hiding for some time. Now, the myth about Alfred is told in part because of this escape into the marshes. It is said that a peasant family took him in and let him live there, though they didn't at the time know who he was. He was not known by sight, and he certainly didn't introduce himself as Alfred. And in keeping with the hospitality of the Anglo-Saxon peoples, they allowed him to come in and stay. And at one point, famously, as the couple went out to do some chores, she asked Alfred to watch some cakes while they were in the hearth cooking. But Alfred was distracted. He seemed to have been thinking perhaps about how to reattack the Vikings, how to take his areas back, how to reunite with his armies. And so he let the cakes burn. And when the peasant woman arrived back, noticing the cakes had burned, she unbraided Alfred for his laziness. And this is part of the story that's most important. Alfred took the tongue lashing in stride and he allowed her to berate him. He didn't say suddenly, well, I'm actually the king. I can do what I want. I can burn all the cakes I want. Tough luck. Alfred took the tongue lashing from this woman. And again, this is probably mythical. It comes from a later date during one of his biographies. But it is actually one of the most famous stories about Alfred. Just about any English schoolboy or girl will know the story that Alfred burned some cakes. But what it signifies is not that Alfred was preoccupied with other matters and too busy to take care of the cakes as he had promised. Rather, the moral of the story is that here is humble Alfred, allowing himself to be berated by even a common person in his realm for something that he had obviously done wrong against his word. Whatever the case, whether he burned some cakes or not, in the end, Alfred is victorious against the Danes. In 878, at the Battle of Eddington, he and his forces, now reunited, managed to smash the Danes. And not just smash them for one time, but, but to have such a success in battle that the Danes were forced to sign a treaty with Alfred, permanently establishing a separation of their two realms. Now, two things are to note about this treaty. First, and most importantly, is Alfred stipulated in the treaty that the Danes, particularly the king of the Danes, and therefore all of his tribes, were to undergo Christian baptism, and that he was to accept the Christian faith if he was to remain in the areas of Anglo-Saxony. And the Viking king agrees. He submits to Christian baptism. And it seems to have taken, <laughs> at least in general. The areas that he settles will, over time, become fully Christian and will be indistinguishable in terms of the faith from the areas of Wessex. The other element of this treaty is the establishment of the Dane law. And the Dane law is, is not a thing, it's a place. The Dane law is the area that the Danes now establish. And that area is to the north and to the east. Here, permanently, the Danish settlement will reside and it will keep to its own space. And to the south, Alfred and the Wessex kingdoms will rule there on their own. Now, this permanent settlement by the Danes, by the Vikings, in the area of Anglo-Saxony will have a permanent effect on the future of England. First and foremost, the Danish people bring a Scandinavian language with them. And those who study languages will tell you that there are a number of words that come into the English vocabulary that shape it permanently. Most of the words that have the TH sound, for example, come from the Scandinavian languages. Think of the words there, this, them. These are all borrow words from the Scandinavian regions. Also, just about any word that begins with an SK, skull, skate, these kinds of things, also come over from the Danish language. But it's not just language. There is a significant cultural intermingling between the Viking Scandinavian Danish cultures and those of the native Anglo-Saxons. Now, we've already said on several occasions that Anglo-Saxony is part of this Germanic world the Celtic world to the south and the continent, the mingling of the Celtic Frankish worlds with the Germanic cultures, were cousin cultures with the Anglo-Saxons and the Scandinavian cultures. But with the coming of the Danes into Anglo-Saxony, what you see happening is a almost permanent mixture 
of Anglo-Saxony with the Scandinavian world. Now, what of Alfred's reign? Well, Alfred, having now established a separation of the Danish areas to the north and the east, and the areas of Wessex to the south, does a couple of things that are symptomatic of the reason why Alfred ends up becoming called the Great. First and foremost, despite the fact that he has a pretty ironclad treaty with the Danes, Alfred works incessantly to defend and set up fortifications and safe havens in the area of Wessex should the Danes ever come to attack again. Some of these forts are still in existence, but in general, Alfred spent an enormous amount of money on defense. And in a world where you are constantly concerned about fighting, constantly concerned about invasion, and even more so now that that the invading force is just over the borderline between you and the area of the Dane law, for Alfred to invest in the defense of his nation actually increased the stability and the goodwill and the prosperity of the Anglo-Saxon world. But Alfred is also a very literate man. In fact, he is one of the most literate kings of the medieval world. Unlike someone like Charlemagne, who desired to be well-educated, but yet couldn't muster the ability, the gray matter, to learn even how to write his name or to learn how to write, Alfred knew Latin. And he didn't just know Latin. He knew his own native language very, very well, the, na- the, the language being Old English, which is another word for Anglo-Saxon. Of course, Old English is not very English at all. It's actually Anglo-Saxon. It's Germanic-based. If you were to try to read Old English, you actually wouldn't be able to because it, it reads like a different language almost entirely. But Alfred invests in education. More importantly, he invests in education that is based on the language of the peoples. It's Anglo Saxon based. Not only that, but Alfred took several of the texts that were in Latin, some of the most important texts, like Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy, and he translated them into Old English or Anglo Saxon. And so he was an enormous supporter of education. Again, Alfred is often hailed as a sort of second Charlemagne, about 100 years after the death of Charlemagne. And Alfred also is one of the first codifiers of English law that would eventually become one of the great hallmarks of the English civilization. Alfred had written down for the first time something called the Dombok, which is often loosely translated or Englishized as the Doom Book. Now, a Dom or a Doom in Anglo-Saxon means law. So this is a legal textbook. This is a law book. And what Alfred has done is he has written down all of his personal proceedings, all of his legal ratifications, all of the laws that he establishes are now written down and codified and, as will happen over the centuries, they can be referred to, they can be applied uniformly, and they can be amended should there be any issues with the existing laws. Now, this is enormously important for the development of a culture in the Middle Ages, to be able to codify law, and therefore law not simply be the will of the sovereign, is a massive step forward for the culture of Anglo-Saxony. And lastly, Alfred supports the church. Now, most or many medieval kings were willing to support the church. The church was very much willing to give the king a certain amount of spiritual validity. We've already seen how Charlemagne derived a lot of authority from the fact that the Pope himself had coronated Charlemagne. And more than likely, the story of young Alfred traveling to Rome and being coronated by the Pope is an attempt to link Alfred to the story of Charlemagne. But Alfred didn't need it. He had the support of the church in his region, and he supported the church in return. Monasteries for education, churches of all kinds, were supported out of the coffers of Alfred. And so, under Alfred, the Anglo-Saxon kingdom managed to shrink a little bit. Alfred, in the area of Wessex, became one of the central figures to establish the nation. And this is really epitomized in one of his most important moves, which is the reconquering and the reestablishment of the city of London. London had been lost, it had been sort of languished, and Alfred managed to reconquer it. And in the city of London, Alfred reestablished a massive, important base of operations for the Anglo-Saxon peoples. And as we know, London would go on to be the heartbeat of both English culture and the British nation as a whole. Now, one final thing to say about Anglo-Saxony and its future in being shaped by this Scandinavian-Anglo-Saxon mixture. One of the most important things to happen is that eventually the Danish people themselves will become 
enmeshed and marry into the Norman line on the continent. Eventually, in fact, Danish Vikings partner up with the Dukes of Normandy, and they intermarry to such an extent that in many ways you cannot tell the difference between a Viking culture and a Norman culture during this period of history. And the great father figure of this move is Harold Bluetooth. Yes, this is actually the guy who gives us the name Bluetooth, and of course Bluetooth is awesome, so we can give Harold Bluetooth a round of applause. And the reason why Bluetooth today was named after Harold Bluetooth uh, is at least believed to be the fact that Harold oversaw and ruled over so many different languages and cultures, and yet somehow he manages to communicate with all of them effectively, that the inventor of the modern Bluetooth decided that this would be a good name to attach to their technology since it allows different devices to communicate with one another. Now, Harold was married into the Norman line, and therefore, over a period of about 200 years, the Dukes of Normandy and the Danish Viking establishment and the intermarrying with the Danes becomes an established feature of that period of the continent. Now, these areas of Normandy, over several hundred years, end up ditching the linguistic patterns of their forefathers. They end up leaving off Old Norse and Old English and they end up taking on Old French as part of their language heritage. Well, moving on down into the year 1000, what begins to happen is the Anglo-Saxon kings begin to weaken. And, as it would happen, in 1066, the king of Anglo-Saxony dies. And there were actually, as a result, two claimants to the throne. But one of the more aggressive kings who wanted that throne was actually a man by the name of William the Bastard. And William was the Duke of Normandy. And so he mounted an army, loaded them onto ships, and sailed for Anglo-Saxony. And in 1066, at the Battle of Hastings, William the Bastard conquered and took the Anglo-Saxon crown for himself. And since he was the winner and the victor in the battle, he eventually became known as William the Conqueror. Now, 1066 is dramatically important because it is the link between Anglo-Saxon England and the Scandinavian influences on England, and the eventual French connections to the English peoples. Because William the Conqueror is coming from Normandy, and because they have given up their Germanic culture and have adopted a more French culture, when the Dukes of Normandy, when William the Conqueror and his heirs come and land in England in 1066, and they take it for themselves, Once and for all, England will cease to be part of the Scandinavian orbit of the world and will increasingly become tied in more and more with the French world. Because William the Conqueror and his heirs will not just conquer England, they will go down and conquer other areas in the French regions as well. And the importance of this should not be underestimated. There are all kinds of collisions between England and France as a result of this takeover of William the Conqueror of England. For one, England starts to become a francophone culture. That is to say, English starts to take on French words that it never had before. And as all school children should know, this French influence on English is one of the reasons why English is so weird, so complicated, why there seem to be three different names for every single thing, some French, some Germanic. It's because when William the Conqueror comes to take over, he imposes Old French, the French language, onto the English culture. More importantly, though, William the Conqueror's heirs are, for a period of time, feudal vassals to the Dukes of Normandy and eventually to others in France as well. And as we look down the corridors of time into the High Middle Ages and on into the Late Middle Ages, when we look at things like the Hundred Years' War, where you have a dynastic struggle between the kings of England and the kings of France as to who controls what regions, All of the roots of those battles and those struggles and the constant torturous wars between the English and the French have their start here in 1066, though they have their start even before that in the intermarrying between the Danes and the Dukes of Normandy. And because the Scandinavian peoples, because the Vikings came crashing into all of the cultures of this region, the long history of the Middle Ages And the stories between England and France have their roots here. And so, to conclude, King Alfred was a vitally important king in Anglo-Saxony. But more importantly, all of the events that surrounded his coming to the throne 
in his reforms of Anglo-Saxony were wrapped up into a cultural ethos that was swirling and changing over the centuries after his death. The mixture between the Danish or the Scandinavian peoples and those of Anglo-Saxony, and eventually the mixing of the French Norman peoples, which were also Scandinavian, believe it or not, and the Anglo-Saxon peoples, was an enormously important change in all of these regions. And it led to innumerable wars and bloodshed and all kinds of struggles that we will talk about in future lectures. Mm -hmm.